We uh, didn't realize there was anybody else out there at first. We were just, like I said, goofing off. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we come up on, or didn't really come up on, we noticed there were people on the track. So a flashlight come on and then go back off. They weren't looking in our direction, but we could see the light. And so we kind of quieted down and snuck up a little bit closer to see what was going on. And there was five individuals uh, standing on the tracks. One thing that struck my curiosity is, uh, at the time, my mother was dating uh, an attorney named Dan, uh, Dan Harmon. I, I knew him well enough to recognize him. There were uh, two more individuals that, uh, a few minutes after we got there, uh, were walking down the railroad tracks that had a rifle uh, and what looked to be a flashlight. And they were more or less kind of minding their own business. Uh, and when they realized someone else was on the tracks, uh, they stopped and was fixing to turn around when someone uh, or Danny motioned for him to come closer uh, over to where they were. Uh, they hesitated and uh, eventually ended up uh, walking on towards the rest of the group. While my head was turned, I heard a, what sounded like a gunshot, a soft flash, as you would expect with a gunshot at night. We were pretty much terrified and bolted and ran. So would you say you're... 100% sure? So I was 200% sure it was Danny Harmon, without any doubt. Without any doubt. Other witnesses corroborated that evidence. I know that Dan Harmon went down there, because I was down the road from there, sent an automobile. I do know that a drop was made. I've uh, absolutely 100% unequivocally made there that night. The track that night, to my knowledge, were Dan Harmon, Keith McCaskill, Larry Rochelle. One thing to note is that Linda Ives launched a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit on August 24, 2016. And we're going to take a close look into a few of these documents, and you'll see why she launched the lawsuit. And we'll start with this one. And one thing to take note of is that I've taken the liberty to unredact a few of these documents based on what I know about the case. And in this instance, I'm 100% positive this is Charlene Wilson they're talking about. And it says, inasmuch as Wilson has provided information concerning this alleged cover-up, she was asked to take a polygraph. And the examiner's conclusions stated it is the opinion of the examiner that the examinee's responses to the relevant questions were not deceptive. And I want to point out as well, if you go over to the Investment Watch blog site, you should read this article and here's the link for it. It's an excellent article chock full of information on the case, and in it they relate a KARK news story from August 12, 1999, and Kark is the local news channel for Little Rock since something like 1953 or something, and Kim Miller was the channel's news reporter doing the story. And what she said about Charlene Wilson is that Wilson says she cannot directly connect anyone with the murders of the boys whose bodies were found in the railroad tracks. But, she says she dropped then-prosecutor Dan Harmon off near the tracks that night and waited while he went to pick up a drug drop. She says that when Harmon returned, he had blood on his pants, as if he had wiped his hands on them. But I notice that makes two accountings now by Charlene Wilson, that she was in a car near the tracks that night, while she waited for Dan Harmon to do his business at the tracks. I know that Dan Harmon went down there, because I was down the road from there, sent an automobile. As far as Tommy Newhouse, I'm also quite positive that these couple of documents relate to his polygraphs when he came in to give his witness testimony. And this second one we'll come back to in a bit, as I found something rather interesting about it. Unfortunately though, we'll never get the chance to ask Tommy Newhouse about what happened that night as he passed away February 6, 2013 at the age of 36. Now we know that Dan Harmon was appointed special prosecutor by Judge John Cole, and in this document we can see that the Little Rock FBI investigation reveals that Benton Chief of Police Rick Almendorf, Judge John Cole, and Dan Harmon were at Judge Cole's residence when Dan Harmon suggested that he be made special prosecutor for the Ives Henry case. So Harmon, who has been named by three people as being at the tracks and involved in the boys' killings, himself asked to be placed as the special prosecutor for the grand jury. Then it says, 
Since the beginning of the investigation by the special prosecutor, the case has become riddled with rumors and innuendos. Special Prosecutor Harmon and Assistant Richard Garrett requested assistance from the Arkansas State Police, yet continuously withheld information from them. A gag order was placed on the case, yet Little Rock FBI investigation reveals that the gag order was violated by Dan Harmon, who would release information to the press on a regular basis. Further, since the beginning of the FBI investigation, December 1993, numerous individuals interviewed have provided information alleging the involvement of Dan Harmon and another entity that's redacted under that long line, but their alleged involvement is in drug trafficking as well as involvement in the deaths of the captioned victims, which are Kevin and Don. And this too is another document that we're going to come back to. Moving along, here's an FBI document from February 1995, and in it, it states, that it appears that the special prosecutor appointed in this case, and we know that's Dan Harmon, may have misused his authority and disregarded other leads that may have assisted efforts to bring this investigation to a logical conclusion. Lastly, it also appears that certain Saline County officials may have conspired to cover up the investigation into the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. And in this report, down at the bottom, it says, a systematic approach regarding the issuance of subpoenas has been discussed with the agreement of, and it says Dan Harmon under there, I'm pretty sure, being the first target. I also came across this newspaper clipping of an article from the same U.S. Attorney's investigation that was being run by Chuck Banks and Bob Govar, and in it, it says witnesses in an upcoming federal trial will testify that a Hot Springs man indicted on charges of conspiracy to distribute cocaine and marijuana had social ties to prosecutor Dan Harmon and his family. And in this 1991 article, we can see that Harmon was cleared of all allegations of drug crimes, cleared by U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Arkansas, Chuck Banks. And there was another officer long rumored to be at the scene that night where Kevin and Don were killed. I've got it on good word that this document relates to Officer Danny Allen. And it says Danny Allen is alleged to have been involved in the murder of Ives and Henry. And on December 15, 1994, Danny Allen was subpoenaed to the Little Rock office of the FBI to give hair and blood samples. Allen was asked to take a polygraph concerning his knowledge surrounding the deaths of Henry and Ives. And Danny Allen agreed to take a polygraph. And in the examiner's conclusions, we can see that it says it is the opinion of the examiner that the examinee was deceptive. During the post-test, Danny Allen maintained that he had absolutely nothing to do with the deaths of Kevin Ives or Don Henry. And he admitted that he did very little, if anything, to attempt to solve these murders. Then it goes on to say that Allen still continued to maintain his innocence about being involved in the murders of Henry and Ives. When told that he would not change the examiner's mind, Alan got up and walked out of the interview room and refused to talk with the interviewing agents any further. During the pretest phase of the polygraph examination, Alan was asked why he was in the room and stated that he was there because he was stupid enough to have agreed to take a polygraph. And in this FBI document, dated December 22, 1994, and if we remove a bunch of the redactions, we can see that it says, for information of Little Rock, Danny Allen was polygraphed regarding knowledge of caption case on Thursday, December 15th, 1994, which is the same date as the document we just looked at, so we know it's the same person, Danny Allen. And skipping down below, on the polygraph, Allen was asked specific questions regarding the caption subject's deaths. Although Allen proclaimed that he knew nothing, the results of his polygraph clearly indicated deception. Special Agent Redacted reported that Allen indicated strong deception regarding knowledge of who killed the boys as well as who put the boys on the tracks which is something I brought up in my other video, Murder on the Tracks, in that that statement is very indicative of two separate entities involved in the murders of Kevin and Don. One entity involved in the murders, while the other entity involved in putting them on the tracks. And according to Billy Jack Haynes' statement, it was Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell who killed the boys, and Dan Harmon and Richard Garrett, and Billy Jack Haynes, who put them on the tracks. It's little details like this that I believe makes Haynes' statements much more plausible. Anyways, it further goes on to say, Danny Allen did advise Special Agent Redacted that he believed, and I'm pretty sure under this redaction it said Special Prosecutor Dan Harmon, to be involved in the deaths of the boys. And this too is another document that we're going to come back to shortly. But as we can see, there's all kinds of documents that name Dan Harmon in relation to the boys, and in relation to their murders, and in relation to drugs as well. And I've only showed you just a few. And here's another example where we see Prosecutor Dan Harmon though we're not allowed to know in relation to what it is, except for that a confidential witness said something about it. And as time would go on, Harmon's nefarious ways would finally catch up with him, such as threatening to kill his wife, as can be seen by this newspaper article. And in 1996, 
Harmon would finally get busted, and ultimately he'd be charged with 11 felonies, five of which he was convicted for, including racketeering and drug charges. But of course, in any of these trials, none of the stuff we've looked at was brought up, and they didn't look into any of his possible involvement with the murders of Kevin and Don. It's as if the stuff we just looked at, which was just the sample, never even existed. Dan Harmon stood accused of stealing drugs from his drug task force, putting them back on the street, and cutting deals with drug suspects for money and sexual favors. At the end of his trial, he left the federal courthouse guilty on five of 11 charges, the most serious racketeering. The name Dan Harmon first came to light in 1988. Harmon was a county prosecutor taking on one of the biggest murder cases in the state's history. The deaths of Kevin Ives and Don Henry, two teenagers found dead on a railroad track in Saline County. Harmon resurfaced three years later when he was slapped with four federal charges for tax evasion. Harmon was subsequently thrown in jail for refusing to take a drug test. After 19 days behind bars and an appeals court hearing, he was freed from his first stint behind bars. His freedom continued until July of 1992 when Harmon was found guilty of not filing a tax return for 1988. He was then fined $25 and sentenced to two weeks home detention. Harmon hit headlines once again when four bricks of fake cocaine were found in his ex-wife's apartment. The bricks were evidence belonging to Harmon's 7th District Drug Task Force. Three months later, Harmon's ex-wife, Holly Duvall, accused him of kidnapping and assaulting her. He was jailed again, and this time refused to leave in the hope of getting a speedy trial. It was during this time period he began a hunger strike in jail, underwent a psychiatric evaluation, and even shaved his head. Throughout this time in the spotlight, Harmon often criticized the media and even hit an Arkansas Democrat Gazette reporter. Later that month, he negotiated a plea arrangement. Several of his charges from kidnapping to disorderly conduct were reduced in exchange for his resignation from office. That day came in July of 1996, as Dan Harmon cleared his office and moved to the Gulf. Accused of racketeering and drug offenses is a free man today. Harmon was released from federal custody yesterday while he awaits his trial. You may remember just last Thursday, Harmon was jailed after refusing to take drug tests. However, during a court hearing yesterday, he told a federal magistrate he would submit to those tests. Harmon maintains his innocence and says he is a victim of government harassment. Sir Dan Harmon got out of jail yesterday. A federal grand jury indicted Harmon on 11 counts. He ended up jailed after he refused a drug test, a condition of his freedom until trial. After 15 hours of deliberations, a federal jury found the former 7th District Prosecutor guilty on five of 11 felony charges. After two days of deliberations, the jury found Harmon guilty of five of 11 counts, guilty of drug charges, racketeering, and extortion. Every one of those counts that they convicted me of extortion of, every bit of that money went to where it was supposed to go. If they can stick some garbage like this on me, then every American better be scared to death. Um, yeah. Meanwhile, after serving nine years of a 10-year sentence, Harmon would get arrested again in 2010 for selling drugs. It is tonight's top story. Police say the six-month investigation that landed Harmon behind bars also led to the arrests of a dozen other people in Grant County. Anybody who sells drugs is a threat to the public. Former Saline County prosecutor Dan Harmon is back behind bars, barely four years after serving time for extortion, racketeering, and drug conspiracy from a 1997 conviction. You know, if he thinks that he's going to be able to do it because of his status as being a former prosecutor, he's wrong. It's not going to happen here. Harmon is among the last few alleged drug dealers taken off Sheridan streets after a six-month investigation. Harmon lives in Saline County, but the investigation led police here to a traffic stop. Police say they found several drug items in his car. Harmon's passenger, a well-known drug dealer, is also now helping authorities. Assistant Chief Brent Cole says the former prosecutor is facing several felony charges that could land him in prison, this time for life. Dealing drugs near his school. What a piece of work. And that's literal, as reportedly he was selling them right out of his car. I wonder how many lives of young people this guy's actually ruined. So let's have a look at Dan Harmon's good friend, sidekick, and deputy prosecutor, Richard Garrett. We certainly don't have any suspects that have uh, 
this point in time. It's been quite a while, um, and, and I, I really didn't anticipate that it would take this long when we first started. I'm frustrated in the amount of time that it's taken. Frustrated that we weren't able to accomplish some things we probably should have been able to. Whatever it comes out of it, if someone's charged or not charged, the, the grand jury has done a tremendous job. But it still will leave the open question, where, uh, if the boys were murdered, who did it? Well, until it's solved, that's correct. So in going back to those documents that I said we'll come back to, here's the first one. And going down near the bottom, it says Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Richard Garrett was requesting that individuals with tips on captioned victims' deaths call in information. And then on this 1994 FBI document that we already seen concerning Officer Danny Allen, we can see that they say Unsolved Mysteries is currently running an old film clip, which was made shortly after the boys' deaths. And the clip they're talking about originally aired on October 12, 1988, a little over a year after the boys were murdered. And it goes on to say, Featured on the tape are Danny Allen, Richard Garrett, and Curtis Henry. And that's the film clip, or tape, as we just saw in the other document, where Richard Garrett was requesting that individuals with tips call in. Then it further goes on to say, in light of a possible law enforcement cover-up, it is requested that the FBI remake a tape on Unsolved Mysteries to replace the current tape running. Now why would they request that? What was happening between October 12, 1988, when Richard Garrett was requesting people to call in, and December 22, 1994, when the FBI mentions a possible law enforcement cover-up and requests the remake on the Unsolved Mysteries tape to be made. So what was happening between that time frame? Well, we can see here that Keith McCaskill was murdered. He was murdered on November 11, 1988. And don't forget that both Billy Jack Haynes and Charlene Wilson have named Keith McCaskill as being on the tracks that night. Then there's Greg Collins, and Greg Collins was subpoenaed by the grand jury to testify in regard to the deaths of Ives and Henry. Prior to his testifying, Collins was murdered, and he was murdered in January of 1989. The same document mentions Keith Coney, who was murdered in July 1988, but that was five months before the October 12, 1988 airing of Unsolved Mysteries, where Richard Garrett was asking for witnesses to call in. And Keith Coney was the guy in the motorcycle, identified in numerous reports as being with Kevin and Don that night. But in going back to the time frame after Richard Garrett's appearance on Unsolved Mysteries, we can see that Jeff Rhodes was also murdered in April of 1989. And he just so happened to be a good friend of Greg Collins, who we just saw was murdered in January of 1989. And then there's the setup death of Richard Winters, who I don't happen to have a photo of, but he was murdered in July of 1989. And in all, there were at least six murders with links to Kevin and Don's murders, and the bulk of them happened between October 12, 1988, when Richard Garrett was on Unsolved Mysteries asking for people to call in, and December 22, 1994, when the FBI wanted to remake the Unsolved Mysteries tape to replace the old one, in light of a possible cover-up by law enforcement. And not only that, but there's more. Here's the FBI document we looked at about Tommy Newhouse's polygraph. And I just happened to find another version of the document that you can tell was rewritten, but it has far less redactions. And when you put them side by side, you can see that the body of the document has been changed, though the context is still the same. But we can see that the first paragraph has been completely unredacted now. And let's have a look at what it says. And it says, after this murder was aired on Unsolved Mysteries, and this is the October 12, 1988 show they're talking about, and after that show, Harmon put Richard Garrett in charge of all leads. Individuals would call in with information and a formal statement was never taken. The individual would then be threatened by telephone to keep his or her mouth shut. So would this be one of the reasons that the FBI requested a remake on the tape of the Unsolved Mystery shows? Seems like it might be a likely conclusion to me. And there were other witnesses in the case too, as we can see by this document, though we don't know who but this person may have knowledge of who is responsible for the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. And in this same document I noticed where it says, Dan Harmon enlisted the help of the Arkansas State Police. And I'm reminded that in this document, it says Harmon and Richard Garrett requested assistance from the Arkansas State Police, yet continuously withheld information from them. Here's another document where we see the names of a couple of murdered witnesses that we already had a look at, and a couple more names that we haven't seen. And somehow, all these murdered people are tied into Kevin and Don's murders. And here's another document of a witness, who again we don't know, who alleges to have information regarding Keith McCaskill, who as we know was knifed and killed. And let's have a listen to what Richard Garrett has to say about Keith McCaskill. I think that Mr. McCaskill was probably suffering from a lot of paranoia. And right now the indications are that 
Nobody else was involved. Might there have been a reason, though, for his paranoia? I'm sure there was a reason for his paranoia. Uh, because he had talked to the police or to the prosecutor? I don't know that that would be the reason. And did you catch that? Smile on doll. Paranoia? I'm sure there was a reason for his paranoia. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that Keith Mikasa had a good reason for some paranoia as well. Now we'll have a look at Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell. And there's documents from two different witnesses that relate the same story that what appears to be Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell beat Kevin and Don unconscious at the grocery store and threw them in the back of the car and took them back to the tracks, which also fits into the accounting of what Billy Jack Haynes says. So in this Arkansas State Police document dated June 20th, 1988, we can see they did an interview of witness Ronnie Godwin. And in it, we can see that Mr. Godwin was interviewed by this investigator, who was Sergeant Barney Phillips, along with Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Richard Garrett. Go figure. Godwin stated, last August, either on a Sunday night or a Saturday night, he observed a police car that was gray in color with three antennas on the trunk by the grocery store as he was driving by. And he says there were a couple of officers pushing a subject up against the telephone booth. I pulled off the road by some tracks and watched. There was a subject laying on the ground, not moving, and another officer was standing off to the side of the car. And further, he says, as I stopped my car, I saw them pick the boy up off the ground and throw him into the back seat. After putting the boys into the back seat of the car, they drove off up to the top of the mountain. In about three to five minutes, they came back down and drove past where I was sitting. I did not see the boys in the car at this time, just a grocery or a garbage bag sitting in the back seat. And then, three days later, another Arkansas State Police officer did an interview of Ronnie Godwin on June 23, 1988. And Officer Dale Swayze says, Godwin gave me the following information concerning what an anonymous caller reported to the State Police as information concerning the deaths of two boys on the railway track at Benton. And just to know, Godwin was incarcerated at the time of these interviews, but he was relaying what happened almost a year earlier when he left Gigi's nightclub and was traveling home. And when Godwin left Gigi's and was traveling home, he saw two men he believed to be police officers, two teenage boys, and what he believed to be an unmarked police car. He estimated the time at approximately 2.30 a.m. He described the vehicle as a gray playing car. He said the car had police hubcaps, three antennas on the trunk, and a spotlight on the side. One of the men was seen pushing a teenaged white male against a phone booth. Another teenager was kneeling on the ground between the phone booth and the police car. A second man, Godwin believed to be a police officer, also was standing over the teenage boy kneeling on the ground. Godwin proceeded south on Highway 111, past Shoal Road, and pulled into a trailer lot just south of the Miller's Grocery parking lot, which I believe was one and the same as the Ranchette Grocery Store. Godwin watched as the man in the white shirt pushed the boy against the phone booth several times, and both men loaded the two boys into the back seat of the car. Godwin said the car went up the road and apparently did not turn off until it went over the crest of a hill. Godwin said the car came back approximately five or 10 minutes later. He said as the car passed, he noticed a bag, he believed to be a garbage bag, in the back seat of the car. Godwin provided information by drawing a map, location of his vehicle, and the location of the grocery store, and the phone booth. A compilation of the information will be provided on a diagram attached to this report. And here's that compilation diagram. And if you'll note, the diagram is composed from information provided by Ronnie Godwin. It was done by the Arkansas State Police, and it's an accounting of Ronnie Godwin's statement of him traveling south on Highway 111. And as he was driving by, he noticed an altercation between what appeared to be two police and two teenagers, which prompted him to duck into a trailer parking lot and watch what happened. And here's a zoom in of that drawing if you want to see the details of what Godwin was reporting. In the location of the telephone booth, where the larger man with the white shirt was pushing the boy against, and just to translate that hand-drawn map into something more real, we can look at the ranch at grocery store and the property it's on and what it looks like today. And we can see the corner probably looks pretty much the same as it did back then. And there's the store. And this would be the area where one of the boys is reportedly being pushed against the phone booth, with X marking the spot of where the phone booth was. And sadly, this would be the location where Kevin Ives and Don Henry would encounter the beginning of their brutal and horrific murders. And something else I noticed, swinging around and having a look from a different angle. This was the probable location of the phone booth. Now I don't know how many years ago the phone booth was taken away from that corner, but you notice the grass hasn't taken color. 
almost like a refusal to conform, in defiance, in the memory of Kevin and Don. And now we'll take a look at another Arkansas State Police witness statement document, taken on February 22, 1990, almost two years after Ronnie Godwin's statements. And in an interview of Mike Crook, he related that the morning the two boys' bodies were found, a guy he only knows as Jerry came by and told him that late last night he was sitting across from the ranch at grocery store when two boys walked up and one boy rode up on a motorcycle, and that would be Keith Coney. Crook states that the boy in the motorcycle rode off, and then an unmarked police car pulled up and two men in plain clothes got out, and Jerry said one of them was Kirk Lane. Crook states that the boys and these two cops got into an argument, and the two cops beat the boys unconscious and threw them into the car, and then drove off. And that would be the accounting of what Jerry told Crook, who was relaying this to the Arkansas State Police, two years after Ronnie Godwin's matching accounts of the same situation. But Crook states that before Keith McCaskill was killed, McCaskill told him that Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell were following him around, and he, being Keith McCaskill, was afraid they were going to kill him. Crook also states that after McCaskill was killed, Lane and Campbell shot up his house one night. He states that his son was at the club, and someone called and said McCaskill is dead, and you are next. And then later, shots were fired into his house, and when he looked out, he saw the Camaro that Kirk Lane drives. And here's an FBI document dated November 30th, 1994, and it's another one that I'll unredact, as we know who it is, and it pertains to Mike Crook again. And it says, two males from the patrol car began beating the boys, and then threw the boys in the back of the patrol car and took off. Crook believed this guy to be a drunk and basically ignored him, and this is Jerry they're talking about. But then they say, Crook became aware of the deaths of Henry and Ives the next morning, at which time he thought there may be some credence to the man's story. So that makes two witnesses, independent of each other, who don't know each other, both saying the same thing, that they saw two police officers beating up two boys at the grocery store, and one of those witnesses named Kirk Lane as being one of those officers. And there's also accounts of a third witness, naming the police as the ones who killed Kevin and Don. And that would be the boy in the motorcycle, who himself would be murdered less than a year after Kevin and Don, and his accounts would be relayed through his parents. Here's his mother explaining that Keith Coney knew that it was two men that had killed Kevin and Don. And I don't think it was an accident because he was fearing for his life, you know, a couple of months before. He said a couple of times that he knew people, that he was being watched and he was afraid. Mrs. Alexander says her son knew the two teenagers run over by the train, and she says he indicated to her he had been there when the boys had died, that he spotted two attackers. But he knew there was two there. I did try to get him to tell me who, and he, he was either afraid or didn't know. So all Keith Coney would tell his mom was that he knew it was two men that killed Kevin and Don, and that he was fearing for his life, and rightfully so. And if we have a look over here at the idfiles.com website, an excellent site created by Linda Ives and Jean Duffy, we can see that another state police report would have corroborated Crook's statement, and that's Mike Crook who we just looked at, but it would have corroborated Crook's statement about a third boy if pursued, but it wasn't. A December 8, 1988 interview is of Joseph Clark Farmer, a friend of Eugene and Keith Coney, Eugene being Keith's father. Farmer said he was talking to Eugene Coney about the two boys not long after they were killed. And Eugene said, Keith said the cops killed the boys. So while Keith Coney wouldn't or couldn't tell his mother who killed Kevin and Don other than it was two men, he apparently did tell his father it was the cops, which matches the statements given by Ronnie Godwin and Mike Crook and now Billy Jack Haynes as well. And that's not all. There's also this October 12, 1988 Arkansas State Police document that details a tip given in naming Kirk Lane as one of the killers. It says there are physical descriptions following each name, and they say there's an asterisk beside the name of Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell, denoting them as most dangerous. Beside the name of Kirk Lane, there is the notation, kill the Bryant children being investigated. After a physical description of Jay Campbell, there is the notation, told Donna he would rape her and her mother and illegible her dog. A photostatic copy or a photocopy of this paper will be attached to this report. And we have that copy. And also, when Lane and Campbell sued filmmaker Pat Matriciana and lost the case on appeal, here's what the appeal court had to say about them. 
All in all, statements and rumors corroborating the Lane Campbell scenario or implicating them as suspects emanate in varying degrees of detail from multiple sources. And law enforcement records, which were available to the public through freedom of information devices, revealed that purported eyewitnesses implicated law enforcement officers in the deaths of the Eyes and Henry boys, including the appellees, Lane and Campbell. The plaintiffs, Lane and Campbell, could not show that the statement was false, the statement being that they were implicated in the murders of Kevin and Don. So what happened to Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell? Well, as we can see here, in February 2006, Jay Campbell and his wife were arrested on drugs and sex charges. Arrested on Monday were Ronald J. Campbell, the now former Lone Oak Police Chief, who faces multiple felony charges relating to drug and theft allegations, just like Dan Harmon. He was convicted and sentenced, and we can see here from his appeal on October 4, 2007, that a judgment and a commitment order entered April 24, 2007, indicates that a jury convicted appellant Ronald J. Campbell of 28 charges. The appellant, J. Campbell, was sentenced to an aggregate or combined term of 480 months or 40 years imprisonment in the Arkansas Department of Correction. So a month later, on November 5, 2009, the Supreme Court of Arkansas made a decision on J. Campbell's appeal. And after all the explanation, they say the circuit court erred in failing to grant Campbell's motion to suppress evidence seized in the execution of the search warrant. And the ruling of the Supreme Court of Arkansas on J. Campbell's appeal? Reversed and remanded. The state Supreme Court reversed former Lone Oak Police Chief J. Campbell's convictions for running a continuing criminal enterprise. And though he has since been released on bond, he would still be awaiting trial for drugs and theft. And from this article posted on January 28, 2014, on Arkansas Online, we can see that Jay Campbell's wife, after getting out of prison, gets busted again. And as for Jay Campbell, as we just saw, the Arkansas Supreme Court in November 2009 tossed out his conviction, and he was sentenced in February 2010 to 15 years in prison. And as for Kirk Lane, we can see that by 2009, he became the chief of police of Benton. He would then quit as the Benton police chief in July 2017 and take the job of Arkansas's drug director of all things. And how did he land that job? Well, Governor Asa Hutchinson had announced Kirk Lane, chief of police for the Benton Police Department, as the new Arkansas drug director. The very same Asa Hutchinson who as U.S. Attorney blocked investigations by law enforcement into Barry Seal. So, in going back to Linda Ives' Freedom of Information lawsuit, the current status of it as of February 2018 is that the government is trying to get the case thrown out on grounds that it's a still ongoing investigation. The lawsuit itself isn't bringing anybody to trial. The lawsuit's about getting these files unredacted, so Linda might finally be able to find out what actually happened to her son. And as far as an ongoing investigation, and for people to question why does Linda Ives have a private investigator, why doesn't she go to the police, which should be quite obvious by now. But here's the current Saline County Sheriff, Rodney Wright, and guess who he happens to be? Dan Harmon's nephew. So how much actual investigating is being done? It's been 30 years, going on 31. And it's not like Rodney Wright's predecessors were doing anything about it either, as both Bruce Pennington and Mike Frost themselves would end up going to jail too for their own corruption, showing how much time they dedicated to the Ives and Henry case. And all Linda wants out of this lawsuit at this time is access to files such as these. An FBI document dated May 9, 1995, relating to Keith McCaskill. But 23 years later, we're still not allowed to know who, other than it's a Pulaski County narcotics person, and another individual is also mentioned in these pages as an individual who is following Keith McCaskill. But if we go back and look at Mike Crook's statements, we can see that Mike Crook states that before Keith McCaskill was killed, McCaskill told him that Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell of the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office were following him around. What a coincidence. And McCaskill also told Crook that he was afraid that Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell were going to kill him. Now with everything we know about the case, is it possible that underneath these redactions are the names Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane? As I said, 23 years after this report was written, we still don't know because it looks like this. How about this FBI report that says law enforcement officials alleged to be involved in drug trafficking in Saline County include... And everything's all blocked out. 
or here's another FBI report that says, The Little Rock Division has been gathering intelligence on current political corruption in Salem County, which will parallel the corruption resulting in captioned victims' deaths and the captioned victims for Kevin and Don. And of course, current intelligence tells us absolutely nothing. And this detailed FBI report tells us exactly the same. There's this Arkansas State Police report from December 8, 1988, talking about evidence in Kevin and Don's case, say that cigarettes were at one time in the evidence room at the sheriff's office, but he could not say if they were still there or not. And this is 1988. He states that the evidence has changed hands so much that he had given up on trying to keep it all together. And in this FBI document, we can see that evidence from this case, to include a sketch of the accident scene, cigarette butts left at the accident site, pictures of the crime scene, plus the original case file, are missing. And all these areas are still blacked out. And this FBI report from December 18, 1993 says, Saline County officials are baffled that some of the original evidence collected during 1987 is no longer available, and that files are missing. And a year later in this FBI document from August 24th, 1994, we can see that somebody furnished a box of evidence which was found stuck away in a locker. Then it says attached to this memo is a copy of an internal U.S. Attorney memo written from U.S. Attorney Redacted to U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks. And that would be the same Chuck Banks who in 1991 cleared Dan Harmon and all the other salient officials of any wrongdoing in all the drug and corruption charges. And of course, like all the other documents, there's huge redactions, leaving us with nothing but questions. And then in this document, the following year, on March 2nd, 1995, we see that U.S. Attorney Robert Govar supplied Little Rock Division with three boxes of grand jury material pertaining to captioned investigation, as well as corruption in Saline County. And if you remember from my movie Murder on the Tracks, you'll remember that Bob Govar was the assistant U.S. Attorney to U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks, who closed down the investigations on Dan Harmon. And if we fast forward Bob Govar's future, we find out that he would end up working with none other than Jay Campbell. From an article in the Arkansas Leader in 2008, we can see that Govar was demoted the previous year after making threats to that columnist for suggesting Govar must have known that he was illegally using prison labor on his property in Lone Oak. The prison labor, you recall, was provided by Jay Campbell the former Lowen Oak police chief who was sentenced to 40 years in prison on corruption charges. And Govar testified at the Campbell's trial that he didn't know he was breaking the law when he used prison labor. And what did Govar say about Jay Campbell at his trial? As we can see from the Arkansas Times, Robert Govar held Campbell, Jay Campbell, in high regard. And furthers that by saying, I thought he was an excellent drug investigator. I bet he did. It seems they're all quite connected rather well. Some fall through the cracks and end up in jail, but the overall cover-up of the 1980s continues on. And speaking of cover-ups, here's the FBI burying Kevin and Don's case. They say, while there are indications of misconduct within the Salem County criminal justice system, these have not developed into offenses that warrant further federal investigation into the deaths of Ives and Henry. Based on the foregoing, it is my recommendation that the FBI conduct no further investigation into this matter. And that's that, which I find to be incredibly unbelievable. You just have to look at the original autopsy results that were overturned to easily see why an investigation is warranted. And let's go back and have a look at the beginning of the cover-up, starting with the autopsy and who it was performed by. Meet Family Malik, the Arkansas State Medical Examiner, and he did the first autopsy on Kevin and Don and he ruled that they smoked 20 pot joints and fell asleep and didn't hear the train bearing down on them. Media coverage of Malik's dishonest rulings resulted in a massive public outcry calling for his removal from office. The medical examiner comes up and he has fabrication to where he has, has, has created his own evidence. This is of a magnitude it could create a national scandal and if necessary, it will. I have work to do. I do not use me. I have work to do. Excuse yes, me, please. And you, you, you can say that you are honest. Dr. Meow. Lying on his autopsy cases, lying in court. And he's not an honest person. And he should be prosecuted. He should be prosecuted. 
Was they stabbed? The answer is no, they were not stabbed. Were they dead beforehand? Absolutely no, they were alive. A former employee at the crime lab has said he discovered what appeared to be evidence of a stab wound during the original autopsy, but was told, quote, not to worry about it. Malik has refused all comment. I said, I told you before, like our president said, read my lips. I'm not going to command. In an exclusive said, interview, Dr. Fami Malik defended his record. I never lied on her. Never. 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 But not all of Malik's former co-workers hold the same confidence. Philip Kaplan represents Malik's former assistant, Dr. Lee Beamer. Beamer is suing Malik for allegedly firing him without proper cause. Beamer previously revealed that Malik testified about autopsies he never conducted. Dr. Malik refused repeated requests to talk with us. But when we caught up with him, he said people didn't like him because he's from Egypt. And he claimed he had never made a single mistake in any of the 7,000 autopsies he conducted. People say that as the state medical examiner, you were incompetent and you bungled cases and that Governor Clinton, for some reason, defended you and protected you. Is, is that the case? Uh, you have to understand that I did 7,000 autopsies. Not one single case overturned because of me. Not a single case? Not one single case. But that's just not true. And of course it's not true. As we've seen with Kevin and Don's case, a grand jury overruled Malik. The boys had been murdered. Dr. Joseph Burton of Atlanta and a team of pathologists were called in, and they exhumed the bodies of Kevin and Don and performed another autopsy and discovered that Don had been knifed in the back and Kevin's skull had been crushed with a blunt object. This information alone would strongly suggest that the boys were injured, uh, rendered unconscious, or even killed prior to their bodies being run over by the train. The deaths of these two boys uh, most probably were not accidental deaths, but that they met their death as a result of injuries inflicted on them by other uh, people or another person. And you'd be right in wondering why anybody would be defending Malik, and not only defending him, but pushing for raises for him, including Bill Clinton. And maybe this four-page article from the Los Angeles Times, published on May 19, 1992, has the answer. It states, Governor Bill Clinton, the presumptive Democratic presidential nominee, refused for several years to dismiss a state medical examiner whose controversial decrees included a ruling that helped Clinton's mother, a nurse, avoid scrutiny in the death of a patient. The medical examiner, Dr. Fami Malik, was sort of protected by the governor in the state crime laboratory board, said Representative Bob Fairchild. Clinton, Malik, and Clinton's mother, Virginia Dwyer Kelly, 68, deny any connection between Malik's longevity in his job and his ruling involving Kelly. The record shows that Malik testified erroneously in criminal cases, and in one instance he misread a medical chart and wrongly accused the deputy county coroner of killing someone, and in another he based court testimony on tissue samples that DNA tests later indicated had been mixed up with other tissue samples. Three weeks before Clinton announced his presidential candidacy, he pushed Malik to resign, but then the Clinton administration found Malik another well-paying job in state government. It prompted renewed questions about a conflict of interest growing out of Malik's ruling in 1981 that involved Clinton's mother. Clinton, in a written statement to the Times, responded, There has never been any connection between my mother's professional experiences and action I have taken or not taken as governor of Arkansas, and I resent any implication otherwise. In fact, it was several years after the incident that I became aware that the ruling made by Dr. Malik in this case was controversial, and we're just supposed to believe him and take his word for it. This is the same guy that brought us this. It depends upon what the meaning of the word is. Yes. Anyways, the case involving Bill Clinton's mother was hardly the only Malik ruling to come under serious question. Over the years, his rulings and his testimony became controversial and more than 20 additional deaths. Some of Malik's controversial rulings include the Albright case, where Malik ruled his death a suicide. But Albright had been shot five times all five shots were in the chest. Then the Times goes on to talk about the Ives-Henry case, 
and remind us that Malik ruled that they had been smoking marijuana and dozed off, and had slept as the onrushing freight train bore down. But a second autopsy indicated that Henry had been stabbed in the back, and Ives had been struck on the skull, and that both boys had probably been placed on the tracks unconscious, maybe already dead. Malik's attorney says, Dr. Malik has said he doesn't believe anybody laid a finger on those boys. After a grand jury overruled Malik in the Ives-Henry case, Clinton hired two out-of-state pathologists to review Malik's performance. They gave him high marks and said he should get a raise. But the visiting pathologists were paid $20,000 from Clinton's discretionary fund. And let's not forget, Clinton said he offered $25,000 to Prosecutor Black's boss to fund a grand jury. I believe Bill Clinton's an honest, respectable man, and I, I have to believe that he did that. But the fact is, I never got that. So Clinton, by all appearances, wouldn't give a cent to help the investigations into the mountains of cocaine that were pouring into Arkansas. But he would pay visiting pathologists $20,000 to give Fami Malik high marks and suggest that he get a raise. And two months after the pathologist's visit, as we've seen, Clinton sent a proposal to the legislature to raise Malik's salary by 41%. At hearings on the proposed pay raise, Linda Ives, mother of Kevin Ives, and others who felt wronged by Malik's decisions began exchanging phone numbers. They formed an organization, Victims of Malik's Incredible Testimony, or VOMIT. For three years, VOMIT says, Clinton's staff has refused to let it present the petitions to the governor. Clinton's continued inaction caused suspicions about his motives. And when they're talking about the case with his mother in 1981, they're talking about an incident that happened at around 4.15 a.m. in which Billy Ray Washington, a black man, and his wife were walking home from a bar. And a car full of whites drove by, and someone in the car shouted racial epithets at the black couple. Then, Washington says, someone in the car threw a beer can at him, in response, he says, he threw a chunk of concrete. So anyways, the chunk of concrete went through the window and hit the face of Susan Deere, a 17-year-old single mother, and she was taken to the hospital. She was hit in the face just a little after 4.30 in the morning, and she wouldn't be taken into the operating room until 9 a.m. And by all accounts, other than some scarring, she was fine. She was stable, vital signs were excellent, blood pressure stable, no abnormalities of the cardiac rhythm, and in fact her parents were repeatedly told by nurses entering and leaving the operating room that Susie was doing fine and would be out of surgery in a little while. Then, the nurses stopped coming out, and the next thing they knew, they were told that she was dead. It was not until three hours into the surgery that Deer's condition grew critical, medical records show. Clinton's mother, Virginia Dwyer Kelly, was her nurse anesthetist. The records show that Deere's doctors asked Kelly to transfer oxygen tubes from her nose to her throat so they could proceed with no surgery and that Kelly had difficulty with the transfer. After she had taken the tubes out of Deere's nose, she was not able to insert them into her throat, the records show. The records show that Dr. James Griffin, an ear, nose and throat specialist, took over and inserted them for her. The records do not show how long Deere was without oxygen, but immediately following the reintubation of the patient orally, she developed bradycardia and within a matter of seconds, she went into complete cardiac arrest. Malik performed an autopsy on Deer. He said her death was caused by blunt trauma and laid it at the hands of the person who threw the chunk of concrete that hit her. He called it a homicide. Dr. Griffin gave a few reasons why Malik's conclusions were premature, including saying that the cause of the initial cardiac arrest is not known at this time. And at the time of Deer's death, Kelly, Clinton's mother, was being sued in another case involving the death of another young mother, also from a lack of oxygen following minor elective surgery. So the LA Times goes on to say, if Malik had raised questions about Kelly in his autopsy in the Deere case, it might have complicated her already existing legal problems. Ultimately, Dr. Jocelyn Alders, director of the department, Fami Malik's boss, hired Malik within days as a $70,000 a year consultant. But if Malik or Clinton thought that the resignation would end the controversy, they were mistaken. And they were, as we're still talking about it. And the article goes on to say that on Malik's first day at his new job, the $70,000 a year one, members of Vomit showed up in protest. And one of the signs they held up said, Clinton for president, Malik for general surgeon? And remember, this article was May 19th, 1992, six months before the election. And they wouldn't realize how close they were. When Clinton won the election, he took Jocelyn Elders to the White House with him and made her Surgeon General. Based on the facts I have, I really feel that Arkansas owes Dr. Malik a great debt and a real apology. 
Today, the governor was asked if Malik should resign. I don't think that's a decision that I should make based on what I now know.